Well, we do want to take a few moments to do something extremely important for our church family, and that is ordain a new shepherd and use this as an opportunity to affirm our current shepherds. And if you're a guest today, today's going to be a little bit different from normal, but I think it will also give you a little bit of a glimpse into this church family, our values, the things that we hold important. And so I hope that you'll see who we truly are, at least get a glimpse of that. Someone once said to truly lead people, you must walk behind them. And when we first hear something like that, it sounds strange, doesn't it? That doesn't sound right. What do you mean lead people from behind them? The leader is the one at the, at the front of the pack, right? Carving the, the way for everyone behind him or her. And yet that little expression begins to get at the heart of Jesus and how he led a servant leader, making himself nothing, putting on flesh and dwelling among us. He didn't say that I must be in front of you. He said, I will be with you. And I think it's important that we understand what leadership is. It's leadership that, influ that, that emphasizes influence over authority. It's leadership that chooses not to be distant or to demand to be in the spotlight, but rather leadership that provides constant guidance and support from among the people. Our shepherds often walk behind us. Yes, they're leading us, but often they do that from behind, supporting us, serving us, guiding us to walk more closely in the footsteps of our chief shepherd, Jesus. So much of what they do is behind the scenes. So much is, is things that you don't know about. They're calling people. They're praying for people. They're opening up God's word with people. They're checking on people that they haven't seen in a while. They are pastoring people. So much of what they do is behind the scenes. They are servant leaders. I don't know if you've noticed or not, but over here on this wall in the hallway, we have photos of our shepherds. I, uh, I said at first service, I'm pretty sure I saw a minister put up wanted above those pictures one day. I won't tell you which minister it was, Mr. Risley, but <laughs> no, <laughs> that's not true. That's a joke. But those pictures are not on the wall so that we can say, this is our hall of fame, so that we can necessarily honor them, although scripture says, give honor to whom honor is due. We put those pictures up there because we want you to know who it is to go to when you have a need, when you have a struggle, when you need someone to look after you. Many of you know you have shepherds in your Bible classes, and that's how they shepherd it's impossible for one, two, even 12 or 13 men to shepherd an entire congregation and everyone be responsible for everyone. And so we use classes here, shepherding groups. And so much of what our shepherds do is behind the scenes. As you probably know, over the past several weeks, we have participated in this time of spiritual discernment. We have fasted, we have prayed, we have opened up the word of God. We have lifted up our shepherds in prayer, the mocks in prayer. For four weeks, we have been seeking the wisdom of God. And so today, we are excited to ordain a new shepherd. That word ordain is, is a very biblical word. In scripture, especially the Old Testament, it's used to mean set apart or consecrate. People who were chosen to be priests over Israel were ordained, they were set apart, they were consecrated. What that means is they have a special role, and we acknowledge as a community of faith this role, and we set them apart, and we pray that God would work in them and through them. We yield them to God for his service. So today, we want to do that, but we also want to use this opportunity to affirm our current shepherds. As you probably know, the past couple of years, they've been difficult. They've been difficult on our shepherds as well. They have had to make some very tough decisions. They have had to deal with some very difficult situations. And through it all, they have maintained their faith in God. And they have taken their role as shepherds very seriously, as they always do. And so what better way to encourage them than to lift them up before this community of faith, to let them know that we support them, to pray for them. So we want to do that today as well. The Bible is very clear on the kind of men 
that God has selected, that he has raised up to serve his church as shepherds. We use that word shepherds. It's a very scriptural word. Other words are also used, like elders, of course, bishops, overseers, even pastors. Throughout scripture, when you see those words, it's referring to the same thing. And just the, the acknowledgement of all the different words tells us something, doesn't it? There's a, lot, there's a lot to the job of being a shepherd. There's a lot included in that. There's a lot of roles in the role of shepherd. But look at what Paul says to Timothy and to us. 1 Timothy chapter 3, the type of men God calls to serve in this role. Whoever aspires to be an overseer desires a noble task. Now the overseer is to be above reproach, faithful to his wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not given to drunkenness, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him, and he must do so in a manner worthy of full respect. If anyone does not know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may become conceited and fall under the same judgment as the devil. He must also have a good reputation with outsiders, so that he will not fall into disgrace and into the devil's trap. So God has some very specific things in mind when it comes to the men who serve in this role. I can tell you that the men who currently serve our congregation, and Kyle as well, they take this job, this role, very seriously. And in many ways, each one of them would tell you that I'm really not qualified. And yet they humbly accept that responsibility and that calling. They do not take this role lightly. When we read those attributes, when we read those characteristics, we might think, well, these men, they have it all together. They are perfect. And yet we know, and they know, they are human. They are not perfect. We should remember that shepherds are not expected to be faultless. They are called to be faithful. And that's what they are. Shepherds are our example. They make difficult decisions. They are committed to living pure and holy lives, lives of integrity that honor God. And they lead us as they live their lives in truth with love. These men are accountable. They are accountable to this congregation. They are accountable to each other. They are most accountable to God. As Paul tells Timothy, it's a noble task to be a shepherd. So we want to affirm our current shepherds. I'm going to introduce them individually and ask them to come up and stand in front of the stage area so you can see them and so they can show their support to Kyle and Audrey in just a few moments. Blaine and Deanne Allenbach. Blaine and Deanne shepherd our Transformers class and also are involved in our youth ministry. By the way, a couple of our shepherds, including the Allenbachs, are out of town. We had to do some shuffling on this service. It was originally planned for next Sunday, but we had to move some things, and they had already planned a trip out of town, and so that's why they aren't here, and they regret not being here. Richard and Ada Blankenship, they shepherd our Sojourners class. Tom and Pat Brenniger, they shepherd our YMCA group and also help with the Sowers class. Brad and Ann Buxton shepherd our campus ministry and our worship only members. Andy and Marilyn Dean shepherd our Pathfinders group. I think the deans are out of town as well. Jim and Rochelle Gooden, they shepherd our seekers class and also work with our youth ministry. Sylvan and Brenda Gordon. Sylvan just learned how to take a selfie, so we got a selfie from the Gordons. <laughs> they work with the VIP class and obviously do lots of other things within the congregation. Brent and Mary Keck, they shepherd our Catalyst class and the Sowers class. Lyle Kelsey shepherds our Upwards class. Dale and Enid Lawler shepherd our Primetime class. Jack and Joanne Lowry shepherd our Sowers class and our campus ministry. Jack, it's great to see you back. And at first service, Joanne was able to be here. And I was, I gotta be honest, I was surprised that she was here, pleasantly surprised. God has been working in her life. She was really sick not long ago, and we are so thankful for, for her recovery. Merritt and Denise Roberts, who shepherd our young families class. 
I hope I did not overlook anyone. That is not good for job security. I think, I think we got everyone. And let me just say, on behalf of the congregation, we appreciate you men and women so much. And we acknowledge that your role is not always easy. Amid the watching eyes and the widespread expectations, your role requires so much patience, and perseverance, and wisdom. So thanks for what you do, for all that you do. But more than that, thanks for who you are. Thanks for leading us, for being our shepherds. I'm going to read a charge. Really, it's more of an affirmation for these men and women. And at the end, they are going to respond, reaffirming their role as shepherds in this congregation. And they will respond with the words, we will. Here is the charge. It is a noble task, an honor, and a privilege to serve as a shepherd of the Edmund Church of Christ. The role of shepherd requires a heart that seeks to lead through humble service, a mind that is constantly searching and applying the scriptures, and a life that is fully devoted to honoring God. We recognize these important attributes in your lives, and we will willingly place ourselves under your oversight and care. As you renew your commitment to God and to this congregation, we ask you to be men and women of prayer, to earnestly search and faithfully teach God's word, and to lead with the love of Christ, following the example of Christ. We humbly ask you, in the words of Acts 20:28, 20, to keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. We will follow you and your lead in being disciples who make disciples. Will you continue in this calling? In case you couldn't hear them, they said we will. I didn't see any arms being twisted, I don't think. And as you know, today we're so pleased to introduce a new shepherd. Kyle and Audrey Mock come up here on stage and join me. Let me also introduce their children, Carson and Kerrigan. They said they would pay me $5 not to have them stand up in front of everyone. So do you have my cash app? We can, we'll get together later on that. This is Carson and Kerrigan right down here. Kyle and Audrey have been a part of this congregation for a very long time, their college years. They actually met here at the Edmund Church of Christ volunteering in Children's Bible Hour. So uh, Miss Brenda didn't know that she was also a matchmaker when she does Bible Hour. And of course, through their years here, they have been so active. They are involved in the Young Families class and the leadership of that class. In our missions committee, they have planned and gone on so many mission trips. We are so thankful for them and for what God has done and will continue to do through them. I asked them both, what is your prayer for this congregation? And let me read an excerpt from Kyle's prayer. He said, I pray that God will fill us with hope, faith, encouragement, positivity, and love for each other and our neighbors. I pray that our hearts will not be able to contain the good news of Jesus that we will each own the Great Commission and share that good news with our community and the world. Lord, he says, grant us wisdom that can only come from you to lead the church where you want us to go. Audrey said this, I pray daily for the Edmund Church that God would be glorified in all that we say and do, that we would be united in our differences, that the leadership would continue to show Christ's love to the church and the community and that we will continue to faithfully go into all the world to share the good news of Jesus Christ. I think we echo those prayers, and I know that is your literal prayer every day. So on behalf of the congregation, let me tell you how thankful we are that you're accepting this responsibility, this role, and our prayer is that God would continue what he's already been doing in your lives, and that is having an impact on so many people. And so a charge for Kyle and Audrey, and you can respond at the end. Kyle and Audrey, you are accepting an important role as shepherd and shepherd's wife. We recognize the ways you so clearly display the attributes the Bible describes for those who serve his church in these important roles. Today we charge you with the great honor and great responsibility of being a shepherd here at Edmond. Paul tells us that an overseer must first and foremost keep watch over himself before he can watch over the flock. We believe that God blesses congregations whose leaders are fully committed to following him. Therefore, we are counting on you not to be perfect, but to always seek to honor God and stand out as a positive example to the church and to the community. We humbly ask you to be 
uh, to be a shepherd of God's flock, serving, speaking, and leading in truth with love. We humbly ask you to be a family of prayer and to serve alongside these other shepherds and their wives with the spirit of unity. We will follow your lead in being disciples who make disciples. Will you accept this charge? I will. All right. We've asked Kyle to come up and say a few words. Good morning, church family. Audrey and I want to thank each one of you that prayed for us and patted us on the back and offered words of encouragement to us. That meant so much to us. We appreciate those of you that fasted, that experience and uh, your prayers during that time. And that really kept us going and kept us, uh, sustained us through this time. And uh, Audrey and I really had to search ourselves deeply spiritually and our self-reflection. And that was very humbling and uh, such a great exercise for us. And uh, we learned so much about ourselves, about each other, about our relationship. And so we're thankful for that. Your prayers and encouragement meant so much. And that's really how we were able to say yes to this call from God to serve as a shepherd and shepherd's wife. Audrey and I, as Randy uh, mentioned, did meet here in this church and we literally got engaged in this church. And this is our church family. We think of you as our family. These shepherds, all of them, we respect them greatly and great men and women and what a great example they have been to us and how they've led and all the things Randy has said. We see so many of you though as well that have been on mission trips and have taught our Bible classes through these 30 years that have made a big difference on us and have uh, trained us and mentored us and discipled us into the people that we are today. And We're also very thankful for our parents, you know, uh, not everybody's blessed with Christian parents and so they have trained us since we were young to be uh, men and women of God and to serve God and to love God. So thankful for that blessing. Audrey and I love this church and we know that the enemy is out there and is after us and is actively seeking to attack us and to steal our children and to take this church and destroy it. And so if there's something Audrey and I can do and God calls us to do that, to protect this church, to serve this church, to mentor it or, or shepherd it, then there's nothing Audrey and I would rather do in our lives. And so we ask for your continued prayers. Uh, we need those and they'll sustain us going forward. We need God's help. And we just want to say thank you for this trust and joining you in this role, living life together. Thank you. We love you. Thanks, Kyle. Well said. I told Kyle it's tradition. He has to sit in that chair up there for the rest of the service. <laughs> he voted that down, and so when an elder votes, I can't do anything about it. So here we go. You know, it, these shepherds don't serve in a vacuum. To have shepherds, you need what? You need sheep. And we are the sheep, this congregation. And we have a role to play as well. And we have responsibilities, not just these men and these women standing in front of us. We all have a role and responsibility. And one of our greatest responsibilities and one of our greatest privileges is to lift these people up in prayer and to be supportive and to work together to advance the kingdom of God. And so we have a charge for the congregation as well. And so I'm going to ask you to stand now. And if you're our guest today, you can just stand and blend in so you're not uh, uncomfortable. But you don't have to agree. I am going to ask at the end, do you agree? And you know the response by now. You've heard it twice. The, re the desired response is we will. If you have any other vote, keep it to yourself, okay? Here's the charge. As members of this community of faith here at Edmond, we submit to the oversight and the care of our shepherds. We are grateful for the desire these men have to accept the responsibility to shepherd us as a congregation. We pledge to you our prayers and our support. We also commit to being peacemakers and nurturing a spirit of unity among this congregation. As best we can, as redeemed sinners saved by God's grace, we will follow you shepherds as you follow Christ, the chief shepherd. Under your oversight and leadership, we will strive to grow in our faith and in our service to the Lord, and we will work together to grow as disciples who are committed to making disciples. So members of this church family, do you accept this charge? We will. All right, you may be seated. Thank you so much. 
Before you all leave, you can join them. Yeah, you're not, you can join them on the, on the floor. Go ahead. We'll, we're going to pray over you. You're one of them now, so we do want to offer a prayer of blessing over this group. So join me as we pray. Father God, thank you so much for this occasion. Thank you so much for your plan, the way that you have called men to lead and to shepherd. Father, I thank, I thank you for these servant leaders, for their wives, for the way that they are a team. They work together with each other and for each other, but most of all with you and for you. I pray that you would renew their strength, Father. The last couple of years have been difficult in so many ways for so many reasons. So I pray for a spirit of renewal and energy and strength. Breathe into them your spirit, Father, in a, in a big and a bold way so that they can lead and serve in the ways that you've called them, so that they can join us and we can join them, advancing your kingdom, making much of Jesus, making disciples, Father. We do all that to give you praise and glory. We do all that because we submit to you. Father, bless these men and women standing in front of us today. We thank you for them. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, now you may all be seated. That's a long time to stand, isn't it? <laughs> Let me remind you that uh, we will officially welcome Kyle and Audrey next Sunday night with a reception. We hope you can be a part of that. You know, around here, it's not official till we eat cookies together. So reception next Sunday night is a part of Sunday night for the master. We hope that you'll be a part of that. You know, our shepherds do serve in a God-ordained role. It is a position, it's a role that we read about in Scripture. And yet they aren't the only leaders in this room today or online today. The truth is, many of you, most of you, if not all of you, are leaders in some context. If you have an opportunity for influence, you, in many ways, are a leader. Because leadership is not necessarily about position, certainly about not about authority. It is about what you do, and more than that, who you are. And God has called you to be the leader of your family, to be a person of influence among your friends, to be a leader at some level in your company or organization, in your business, in your classroom. Many of you, most of you, have an opportunity for influence, and therefore, you are a leader. So much has been written, so much has been said, about leadership. My guess is that most of you, let's just see, raise your hand if you've ever read a book, a blog, listened to a podcast, or gone to a class or seminar about leadership. Anything like that, raise your hand. Yes. So many of us, right? Leadership is such a relevant topic. Why? Because we are all leaders, and we want to know how to make things happen. That's pretty much the goal of leadership, right? empower a group of people, organize, motivate, mobilize a group of people to get something done. And we often assess effective leadership based on whether or not or how well something is done. In a company, maybe it's the goal of expanding our market share or getting a product to market or increasing our profit margins. In church, maybe the goal is to meet the needs of more people, or to grow the church, or expand our ministries, or go into a part of the world that, that we aren't in right now. In your family, you have goals in your family to accomplish things, to get things done. If you're a parent, you're a leader, you want your kids to clean their rooms. How can I demonstrate effective leadership so that my child cleans his or her room without throwing too big a fit, right? You see, we often assess leadership based on accomplishing things. A plus B equals C. And there's a transaction in that. There's a transaction in that process. But maybe there's a better way. Maybe there's a more effective way. When we look at Jesus, we see something besides transactional leadership. Yes, he motivated and mobilized a team, a group, and they got things done, didn't they? But see, to Jesus, that wasn't the ultimate goal. The ultimate goal was to change lives. The ultimate goal was to change the world. You see, Jesus' approach to leadership wasn't just transactional. It was transformational. That was the outcome he was looking for. That was the bottom line, if you will. 
Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. That means he came to change the lives, the destinies, the eternities of humankind. That's transformation. You say, well, what's the difference in transactional leadership and transformational leadership? Well, one is focused only on getting things done. The other is focused on changing lives. One is outcome-oriented. The other sees value in the process. One is all about what I as a leader can accomplish. The other is about who we can become. One is output-based. One is relationally-based. And so what sets these two approaches apart? What's the secret to transformational leadership that goes beyond just a transaction? Well, I think Jesus reveals that to us. He doesn't just teach us that, he embodies it. And so much of Jesus is unexpected, right? He was the unexpected Messiah. He didn't come like or to do what most people at that time thought he was going to. And he established and revealed a very unconventional kingdom. And so when we look at leadership, or probably probably any topic for that matter, when it comes to Jesus, our answer is going to be unusual in the eyes of the world. It's no different with leadership. And so we go to Matthew chapter 20, starting in verse 20, to see Jesus' approach to leadership and influence. Then the mother of Zebedee's sons, that's James and John, came to Jesus with her sons and kneeling down asked a favor of him. What is it you want? He asked. She said, grant that one of these two sons of mine may sit at your right and the other at your left in your kingdom. (laughs) Teachers, you know about helicopter parents? Jesus had a helicopter mom right here. She's just hovering. And she asked Jesus to promote her sons. Now, you need to know the context here because Matthew tells us that Jesus has just told his disciples for a third time that he's going to be captured, he's going to be condemned, he's going to be crucified. Now, how would you respond if you had been with Jesus, if you care about Jesus, how would you respond to news like that? You would be upset, you would be sad, you might be shocked, surprised, you might have some questions, some follow-up questions. Now, wait a second, Jesus, what did you just say? And yet this mother chooses that moment to ask her question. She chooses that moment to ask Jesus, hey, in your kingdom, in your company, in your organization, can you promote my sons? Can you help them ascend up the org chart? Can you let them be the VPs of this operation, sitting at your right and your left? And you want to say, wife of Zebedee, read the room, right? I mean, it would be like a party planner handing out business cards at a funeral. Read the room. And yet, She was so focused on her own desires, she couldn't see past those things. Look at Jesus' response in verse 22. You don't know what you're asking. (laughs) He just shoots straight. You don't know what you're asking for. Jesus said to them, can you drink the cup I'm going to drink? Jesus says, your thinking has been clouded by selfish desires, by the thinking of the world. You're asking for things you don't even know what you're asking for. You don't even understand the nature of the kingdom of God that Jesus is revealing, and you certainly don't know what it means to lead in that kingdom. You see, their personal agendas had obscured Jesus' mission. I'm glad that never happens to me. I'm glad I never let my selfish desires get in the way of what God wants to do in my life. I'm glad my agenda doesn't cloud out Jesus' mission. I wish I could say that, but it does sometimes. I respond just like these men and their moms sometimes. I can't see past self to see what God is up to. I don't know about you, but that's certainly a struggle many of us have. And Jesus says, you need to think about this. Can you drink of that cup? That's a weird way of saying, can you handle the implications of your request? You see, in their minds, the cup was going to be a cup of celebration, a cup of of status, prestige, power. Yeah, we can drink of that cup. But Jesus was talking about a different cup, wasn't he? He was talking about the cup of wrath, the cup of suffering. And he says, you know, you, you actually will drink of that cup. And again, I don't think they had any clue what he was saying when he said that. You will suffer is what he was saying. But he says, It's God's business to sort out who sits where in the kingdom. Well, the other 
The disciples get wind of this. They hear what has happened. And the text says they are indignant. That means they are really mad. They are indignant. I can just almost see Peter. Can't you just see Peter, the outspoken one? James, John, where have you been? What's your mom up to? Why, why did y'all, we heard that you were trying to weasel your way up the ladder there. We, we heard that you were asking Jesus if you could be second in command. That makes us indignant, <laughs> right? They're upset. And Jesus being the ultimate leader, the ultimate teacher, recognizes this is a teachable moment. And I think not just for those disciples, but for us as well, because we need to learn this lesson daily. Back in our text, verse 25, Jesus called them together and he said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus says, open your eyes, look around you, see the model of leadership playing out around you. The Roman Empire was in charge, and in the Roman Empire, things like power and status, authority, those things were important. Those were highly valued, not just by the emperors, but by the governors and all the way down. You see, there was a class system. There was a social order. There was a pyramid. And if you were on the bottom of the pyramid, it was very difficult, almost impossible to work your way to the top. You might be able to do it over time if you knew the right people, but that power, that status was often passed down or it was bought. And once you had that power and that status, you did not, under any circumstance, give it up. Instead, you used that power to advance self, to advance your agenda, to advance your desires. So Jesus says, look around, see what leadership looks like. They lord it over others. They misuse their positions. They subjugate those beneath them, those they see beneath them. Do they accomplish things? Do they make transactions? Do they get things done? Absolutely. Look at the Roman Empire. I mean, it was a spectacle to behold until it crashed. But in God's kingdom, life is different. And leadership is different. It's not just about getting things done. Remember, it's about changing lives, changing eternities. It's not transactional only. It is transformational. So Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, And we all, who with unveiled faces reflect the Lord's glory. Just sort of rest on that one for a moment. We reflect the Lord's glory. Are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. You see, the work of God's kingdom is to transform us more and more into the image of his Son, to reflect his glory, his goodness, his love. We often talk around here about becoming more Christ or getting closer to Christ and Christ-likeness. That's what Paul says here. And often that process takes place in a community, and in that community, there needs to be those who lead the way. And that's our shepherds. But it's not just our shepherds. It's all of us. Because you have a context. You have a place where God is raising you up and appointing you to serve and to lead in that critical moment. The question is, how will you lead? How do you view your influence? What approach will you take? Jesus says, rather than exerting power, let go of it. Share it. Rather than using or misusing power, disperse it. That's what that word empower means. It means you take power you have and you disperse it. You empower others. Authority is not to be abused. It is to be leveraged for the sake of others and for the purpose of God. Influence happens not always at the front of the line, but often at the back. I don't think the show is on anymore, but do you remember that show, Undercover Boss? Kind of a 
weird reality show where the CEO or the president of the company or the business would, would put on some kind of disguise so no one would recognize him or her, and then they would join the ranks of the common employee in the company. And they would work in the warehouse or in the assembly line or behind the register or serve the food or you know, whatever the nature of the business was. And as they did that, you got to see, and they got to see, what life as a common employee was. And of course, this whole thing is made for TV, so it's a little dramatized. But at the end, there's the big revealing. The disguise comes off. The people that he or she was working with get to see, oh, you're the big boss. And that whole process doesn't just lead to, okay, we need to do this, this, and this in our company or to make us more effective or to earn more money. But through the show, you get to learn the stories of some of the people. And the CEO or the president learns the stories of the people. And there's always at the end these feel-good moments when the CEO says, you know, you talk to me about your struggles and your kids won't be able to go to college and we want to give you this money so that they can go to college or we want to buy you this car because we know you walk to work every day. And, and so there are things that happen because people are viewed as people that brings about change, change in their lives, change that will forever change the course of their lives. And again, let's admit, a lot of that's made for TV, but I think in all of its imperfections, it gives us just a glimpse, just a glimpse of what effective leadership can truly be like. Leadership that says, I am among you, I am with you, and together we will change things and we will be changed. You see, that's what Jesus taught, but he didn't just teach that, that's what he embodied. Look back at verse 28 as we close. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. If anyone deserved to be served, it was Jesus, wasn't it? I mean, if you have an org chart for the nation of Israel, the Messiah is going to be at the top. If anyone deserved to be served, it was Jesus, and yet Jesus emptied himself. He made himself nothing. He became the very nature of a servant, even giving his life so that your life and your eternity could forever be changed. He brought about the ultimate transformation. That's who calls you. That's who leads you. And that's the model, the example for how you are to lead and I am to lead. It's not about power. It's not about authority. It's about yielding those things so that others can be empowered and forever changed. And our prayer is that God would forever use us, certainly our shepherds, our ministry staff, our deacons, our teachers, our volunteers, but every single person, not even in this context, but all the various contexts represented here, that he would use us to bring about transformation in people's lives. The world can only be changed when people are changed. And that's what God has called us to do. This morning, if you need to respond to Jesus, the one who calls you, don't let anything keep you from it. <clears throat> Maybe today you're ready to confess your faith in Jesus, to be baptized into Christ, to put on Christ and live for him. We will celebrate with you. Maybe we can encourage you and pray for you. A couple of our shepherds and their wives will be in the parlor. It's a room behind me. You can exit out these doors, make your way around the hallway. They'd be glad to meet you there, encourage you, pray for you. Um, or you can come down to the front, and we as a church family will do the same thing. If there's something we can do today, we invite you to come as we stand and sing. He leadeth me, O oh blessed